Okay, everyone, I think we're going to get started. Welcome. I'm Marsha McNutt. I am moderating this group. Not that they need to be moderated, but maybe they do. I don't know. They look, they, they, they look pretty rambunctious today. Uh, the name of this session is The Great Debate, How to Support and Develop the Modern Digital Research Ecosystem to Maximize Benefits of Science for Society and the Research Community. Uh, so, um, this is a, a great topic to be discussing uh, here as we're kicking off the 100th uh, anniversary of the American Geophysical Union, because when you think of it, over the past 100 years, we're still um, using the same old scientific method, but when we think of how much uh, the uh, data part of this has changed, we've gone through incredible digital resolution, uh, revolutions. Um, we're uh, doing research now with um, digital computers, with digital data, with the internet. So um, there, the question that's being asked here are what changes in process, resources, and in funding are needed to support the digital infrastructure and ensure that the scientific record is accessible for future generations. So when you think back 100 years ago, it was very likely that when, you know, Jesse here would have, or his predecessors, you know, many generations before, would have uh, published a paper in Science Magazine, that the data uh, would have either not been there or would have been published with the paper because it would have been, you know, a small amount of observations. Um, however, now it's impossible to publish all of the data in terms of actual um, uh, a printed uh, record of the data with the paper. And so, um, and yet when I look back at my own papers that I published, what is most enduring of the work I did as an oceanographer was actually the data I collected, um, not necessarily the interpretation that I had at the time of that data. And much of that data is still being used to this day by many generations of oceanographers afterwards. So um, I think that if we um, polled our um, panel right now, and I'll introduce them in a minute, I think most of them would agree with um, the FAIR principles, and FAIR, F-A-I-R, stands for the fact that data should be findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Uh, but the devil is actually in the details. And I'm reminded of, of uh, a well-known quote um, that says, first an idea is ridiculed, then it is violently opposed. Then it is acceptable, accepted as being self-evident. And if we were to consider this quote being applied to the idea that uh, data should be um, made open and accessible after you publish a paper, um, back when I was first a student, people hoarded their data. And we've come a long way since then from um, the idea of data being made available as being ridiculed um, to people then um, actually opposing it and coming up with all sorts of reasons why not, uh, why they shouldn't make their data available. Oh, I haven't, I haven't milked all of the science that I want out of it. So they were opposing it. Now I think we're someplace between being opposed to it and it being self-evident because, as I say, there are still many um, details that need to be worked out. And so I think that is what we want to get out of the panel today, how we're going to get through a lot of these details about things like personal privacy and um, things like uh, uh, patient confidentiality and a lot of the other details that we often have and who's going to verify what, who's going to pay for what, where the onus is on the various steps of this. Now we've got a terrific panel here today. 
Um, going down from my right here, we have Maria Zuber, who's the VP for research at MIT. We have Maria Yule, who's um, from the Directorate for Geosciences at NSF. Yashiro Muroyama, who's from the National Institute of Information and Communications Technology, the Strategic Program Office in Tokyo, Japan. Alberto Montanari, who's um, from the University of Bologna, Department of Civil, Chemical, Environmental, and Material Engineering. He's also President-Elect of EGU. And Florian Pepperenberger, who's from the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasts. So I think we're going to get a variety of perspectives from several continents in uh, this uh, great panel. So let's start out with Maria. Okay. Great. So if we could, uh, we could pull up my slide. Uh, oh, I can, prob I can probably do that. <laughs> yes. So let's go. There. there. All right. Okay. Ta -da. All right. So um, great. Thanks for the invitation to uh, to be here and talk with you today. This is a topic that means a lot for uh, for me and my colleagues, and um, I really appreciate the conveners uh, realizing the benefit of trying to throw some light on this topic. So um, so I start. I thought I would start at a, a very high level, and then we can drill. Um, down as, uh, as the discussion progresses. And um, I'll start with the obvious. You know, there, there has been um, a degradation in the public trust of science. So, um, I mean, it ranges from conflict of interest to uh, political interpretations of what's going on as opposed to data-driven uh, things that are going on. Um, and, um, but the one that, um, that we actually have control over by access of the data, I think in the best way, is, uh, is reproducibility. And so it is, um, it is absolutely essential that uh, we as scientists um, look at the situation and, um, and it's our responsibility to do everything that we can do um, to rebuild that trust and to assure that trust. Because if we don't do it, somebody else is going to impose uh, rules on us that probably um, are going to be uh, non-optimal. Non okay. And, um, and so um, with that in mind, uh, I, I thought I would also state the obvious and say that um, with the proliferation of digital data, there's really no excuse anymore for making unsubstantiated claims in the literature. Okay. Um, because it's possible to take a statement and tag it to the particular data set um, uh, on which um, uh, an, an assertion um, is made. And, um, and I just want to underscore um, what Marcia said um, in her opening comments is, you know, in my own work where uh, I collect uh, orbital data um, of the planets, um, the, uh, the, the part of the research that has really endured, you know, has been the data sets that I've created as opposed to the interpretations. I mean, some of the interpretations um, have, uh, have stood the test of time and others have changed in light of uh, further analysis of the data or the addition of additional data sets. And especially when you're putting out those um, initial data sets, um, uh, you know, those, uh, they're important data sets and they're brand new and they're completely novel and journals want to publish them, so you probably get a little bit more leeway than you deserve in terms of what the interpretation um, ought to be. So, um, so it's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's very important that these data sets um, are out there um, and, uh, and are referenced, okay? Um, another obvious thing that, that I will state is that the publication um, of scientific ideas and associated data and models, um, and uh, the archiving um, of the, those data sets. Uh, they are part of the process and of the cost of doing science, but they're not always recognized that way, okay? And, um, and so, um, uh, you know, I, I hear from um, a lot of people about, well, 
I'll fund this, but I just want to pay for the science. I don't want to pay for these other things. I don't want to pay for indirect costs. I don't want to pay for archiving. Um, I don't want to pay um, for uh, um, uh, the documentation um, of the archive. And, um, and so, uh, so we, we need to realize that these are genuine, legitimate costs, because any particular study that's done is going to have to be reproduced. And, um, and in order for the, the uh, study to be reproduced, the data has to be accessible. Um, so um, this, uh, this conversation is not all about money, OK? There are free things regarding open access that are really important um, that don't cost a cent, OK? And I think one of the, an obvious one is thesis holds, OK? I mean, it's very common for somebody finishing a PhD thesis that says, uh, I would like to uh, work on this some more and submit my paper to a high profile journal, so hold my thesis for a year, okay? Um, or I want to patent um, what I'm doing and, um, and we need to hold my thesis. So MIT actually has a very stringent um, uh, open access policy and, um, and you can get a 90 day hold um, on your thesis and then if, if there are extraordinary circumstances, you might be able to get an additional 90-day hold. But unless your life is in danger from what is in your thesis, okay, <laughs> you will not get a hold longer than six months at MIT. So, um, so um, you know, that's another thing that should be factored in there. Um, so um, the, the next point is, in order for this to work, um, in order for the uh, worldwide scientific community to, um, to really all um, get behind this and embrace it, um, everybody's got to follow the rules, okay? Um, we can't have situations where um, it's, uh, you know, you need to release everything and make it accessible and document it um, and bear the cost of that in one country when it doesn't happen um, in other countries. and and our colleagues use that as pushback for why they shouldn't have to do it. So, um, however, we need to realize that uh, just because of the way that uh, the scientific processes work in different countries, that there could be some variation in how these things are implemented. So we have to show some flexibility. Um, there need to be consequences of non-compliance, and you know, I'd love to, you know, because if if there are uh, if there are um, standards by which we say that uh, data should be open and we, we don't enforce them, then, um, then it's, it's not really doing us any good. And, um, and maybe we can have some discussion on this later, but to the extent that we can, instead of penalizing people, incentivize people um, and, and turn it into a positive that we reward the good behavior, um, uh, that's, um, you know, that's a very valuable thing. And finally, I'll just end by saying that um, that that there are um, that there are threats out there in terms of national security and economic competitiveness um, that, um, that that actually are uh, moving the needle away from a fully open access. So there there are issues of um, of uh, what I will call sensitive but non classified data, where a result of a research project in itself. Um, is open and can be freely published, but if you take this result and that open and accessible result and that open accessible result and somebody smart puts them together, um, it, uh, it causes something that, uh, that could be um, a problem. And, um, and so, um, so we need to be mindful of that. And, um, and some of these accusations are bluster uh, but some of, the, some of what's going on is genuinely, genuinely legitimate. And, um, and we need to be mindful of the fact that there are legitimate concerns and we need to work with uh, our colleagues on the national security side uh, to address those concerns so that, um, so that we can s continue uh, to have a mostly, to the extent possible, free and open mm -hmm. system to exchange our data. And I'll stop there. Maria number two. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so I'm, I'm coming from 
a little slightly different viewpoint here. Um, the group that I work with uh, is called the Belmont Forum. And we are a consortium of funding agencies uh, like NSF from 29 different countries. Um, and we uh, focus typically on challenges for global environmental change challenges. Um, and in 2015, we adopted um, a data policy and principles um, that really has start, started to reflect the fair data um, principles and policies. Um, we, we run into sometimes a, a little bit of a, a, a sticky situation where we're asked to support somebody's idea, but you're a funding agency, so you're not supposed to show uh, that you are favoring one group over another. So we came up with our own that basically says we, we um, express very much support for open, for open access. Um, and our data really has, the idea behind it was so that these 29 different groups could actually start to support projects where we are making big strides to have that data open and accessible. Um, the way that we did this was to create a community-driven um, activity or a project in which we had over a couple hundred different um, international researchers and um, but let's just say uh, researchers and stakeholders involved in developing the idea behind what can the Belmont Forum as a group adopt and promote as uh, for open, um, open science and open, open data. Um, with that group, they came to us with lots of different recommendations and in 2012, we said, we hear you and we believe that um, our data policy should make sure that we widen access to data uh, to promote long-term preservation, especially of the disparate data sets that the global environmental change community is using. And I think this gets to a couple of the, the points that Maria made about um, privacy, because we are really encouraging this natural and social science data to be um, collectively put together to solve some of these problems. In addition, we also work quite often with um, stakeholders and indigenous um, peoples. So these, again, are some sensitivities that we need to be able to address to uh, make sure that we are having and being as open as possible, um, but also pr protecting the privacy of, of folks that need, um, need that. Um, in addition, we were really um, wanting to focus on how to improve data management and exploitation. And I think, quite frankly, that's probably the biggest step that we've done so far. Um, we're looking to fill critical uh, gaps in um, the global e-infrastructure. So how do you bring and identify different uh, data sets that people may or may not know of, and how do we make those um, together? Um, and really to share best practices. And so again, we, we felt that our, the data should be discoverable, accessible as open by default, um, and made available with minimum delay. So this gets to, I think, some of the, the points that Maria was making here. Um, one of the things that we are also really pushing for is because of the different um, data sets that we have is that they need to be understandable by those outside of your discipline of origin, right? You're looking at creating a lot of different um, date or create solving trying to solve uh, problems that reflect a lot of different disciplines and for folks to be able to do that that data needs to be not only interoperable interoperable but you also need to understand it so that you can you can utilize it and then it also gets to the manageable and protected um, and again I think this reflects that there are similar um, efforts going on in in quite a few different groups um, and really what we are trying to do is um, create this community and really have it be sort of the next generation of thinking so that it's not something when you're in a discipline and you're doing these things, you, this is something I have to think about. We want it to be something that you automatically think about. Um, so we're looking to help um, develop cultural change in that um, and to do that, we feel that the training 
um, is a critical part of this. Because right now, we don't learn that in graduate school. Um, unless there's a specific thing for you to do. So the Belmont Forum is partnering with different groups to be able to provide opportunities for researchers and stakeholders to learn how to work together on this through what we're calling uh, transdisciplinary uh, training exercises which have um, a focus on um, the interoperability of the data as well. Um, and so what are the next steps for us? I think, um, you know, we, we've been talking about this. We supported this community initiative and that's coming um, to an end and I, and I really do want to thank all of you who've been involved in that because it, it was kind of a long and lengthy process. Um, and we did listen wholeheartedly to what you had to say. Um, we're not there yet. I think we, we have a lot of steps to, to go. Um, but we have been looking at ways to in, increase the awareness and more or less the education through this. So we've come up with some data management templates for the Belmont Forum projects. Um, and we are hopefully, our, our big goal is to make it enforceable over time. <laughs> And what that actually means, um, you know, we're still working out with 29 different countries and, and what those, um, those groups are doing. So um, for now, we are relying on incentives uh, to access to data. Um, we are putting together a task force that is going to be working um, as an outgrowth of the, the group, um, the community-driven group who started to work with some publishers. So how do you cite data sets, give credit where credit is due, um, get the incentives um, for that to happen. In addition, we also feel that the data is part of the science infrastructure and it needs to be maintained and there should be ways for folks to use this and reuse the data. I think that's one of the big things that funding agencies um, have trouble with in the sense that we want bright, shiny, new kinds of things. Um, but you know what? There's a lot of data out there that can be used to find bright, shiny, new things. And so one of the things that Belmont is looking at doing is promoting um, competitive calls where we require you to reuse data. Um, and finally, really, what we're, we're trying to do is then also to um, explore different ways uh, to encourage the younger generation and hopefully move this whole enterprise forward um, through community building but also some incentives for research projects but also um, some publishing. So I'll, I'll just stop there and, and thank, thank you for that. Okay, thank you, Maria. Okay, uh, let's move on to Yoshiro. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, thank you. I, I have a couple of slides, so may I? Do you I... want to come up here? Would it be easier for you to see them from up oh, here? Oh, may I? Yes, please. Uh, just keyboard, too. Uh, yeah, it's I'm the sorry. Mac one. Yeah, Mac. just push the uh. buttons. Okay, yeah, thank you very much. So, yeah, my name is Yasuhiro Murai. I'm from Japan, and I am very new for this community. Especially, I uh, uh, please accept my apology. I didn't have time to say hello to the first two speakers, and <laughs> nice to see you very much. So much. I am now uh, jumping into this uh, AGU community to discuss about the open science and open data. And, uh, yeah, Japan is relatively small country, small landscape here, uh, but uh, uh, we have been trying to make um, uh, also uh, the data sharing fair, uh, data use in a uh, reality uh, in a, a couple of ways. And uh, my uh, talk would be uh, more uh, focused on the political sense and you know, some international policy issues. And Japan, 
didn't have the uh, roots in uh, communities consensus about the uh, open science or data sharing. Uh, the, uh, some people are discussing, but the, uh, it was not the majority of the community. And the, the, these kind of the active discussion, discussions are really uh, admirable for us. And uh, in Japan, the, uh, we had a, a trigger by the G8 science ministers meeting in 2013. Uh, they have, as you know, uh, they agreed on uh, open research data. And since then, Japanese government has started to move, and they hosted a G7 uh, science ministers meeting in 2017. Uh, 2016, then uh, I, I had an uh, opportunity to give an uh, uh, open science talk to the minister's meeting then, and they have uh, successfully agreed about the uh, uh, international community should uh, have a consensus about the uh, importance in uh, incentives and rewards about the data work by the researchers and uh, career evaluation, et cetera. And also importance is on uh, uh, international digital data uh, infrastructure. Uh, it should be, you know, uh, interoperable federated data system is necessary for international uh, community. So uh, this is the background, and uh, I shouldn't go <coughs> too long, but they uh, are. Uh, uh, in Japan, according the, accordingly, the uh, government uh, tried to make uh, uh, some policies uh, of the nation, and, uh, but it's not very much fixed policy. It was very much soft, uh, high-level uh, guiding principle. Uh, that's just saying that open science is good, so data sharing is good. So, uh, but now the uh, gradually community is trying to uh, step in for. Uh, for instance, Science Council of Japan uh, made uh, a couple of com com committees uh, to uh, make uh, a community consensus for uh, open science, open data. But still, uh, you know, the, uh, for instance, the industrial engineering or more uh, as a medical field, uh, the scientists are not very much uh, positive to do, but uh, gradually they are, are uh, having a number of the opportunity to have this kind of discussions. And uh, also the uh, uh, Science Council had a, a good channel to the International Academy. This is uh, my experience in the International Council for Science. And, uh, uh, Codata Data Citation Task Group had a, a basis for data citation joint declaration, as you know. And uh, recently, Codata President uh, uh, was uh, Codata welcomed the new president, uh, Baron Mons, who was the chair for European Open Science Crowd. It is very much symbolic and an interesting phenomena. And the World Data System International Program Office has been hosted by Japan. This is very much honor for us. And my, I myself in charge of the hosting work for this. And uh, uh, WGS has not really uh, understood by the community scientists uh, but the, uh, uh, they are now building uh, some key components for the future data infrastructure, in the metadata links and PIDs, etc. cetera. Uh, the IUGG is having a, a committee, but uh, uh, not many people are uh, aware of the, how they are working, so it could be like other challenges. Okay. So the and Japanese com, uh, ministry is trying to build uh, its own science infrastructure. And uh, however, uh, uh, the, this is uh, very much led by uh, uh, information scientists and engineers. And uh, uh, for myself, this uh, AGU or EGU's activity, the community engagement, uh, the best practices are really good. And uh, we need this kind of experiences, but uh, still we are now on the way to this challenge. And uh, uh, okay, uh, I had that five minutes. So anyway, that's yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, we need uh, this kind of the uh, uh, political top-down approach and the community's bottom-up approach, but also the international federation interoperability uh, standards are really the connecting components for uh, various uh, activities. That's the, uh, I hope that this kind of activity can be usable uh, for the 
US, uh, Europe, you know, it's many countries. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, I would like to stop here. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, Alberto, yeah. you're up next, um, thank you. Do you have some slides so I can hear? Yes, please. First of all, thank you for the invitation. This is a topic that is in my heart, so I'm very pleased to have uh, this opportunity to speak. I'm taking a slightly different perspective, and I would like to start with a, a premise that may look obvious. Uh, we all know that uh, uh, to advance with the slides, uh, Ah, okay, yeah, yeah, this one. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we all know that the history of humanity, if we look back at it, is marked by fundamental invention and discoveries that uh, marked uh, step changes uh, in the lifestyle and uh, in the habits of humans. And uh, examples, trivial examples, are the invention of the wheel or the discovery of America. It's interesting to see that uh, these steps forward generally are not immediately perceived by contemporary people. Only a few open-minded persons can perceive the changes while they are occurring. And if we look at the history of science, the story is similar. And uh, even in science, we have uh, several step changes whose importance was not immediately perceived. And it's, uh, it's a proof, for instance, the fact that several landmark papers were poorly cited at the time when they were published. So let me provide a few examples, like the invention of the mobile phone, or more relevant to scientists, the internet. We can barely remember how our life of scientists was when we didn't have the mobile phones and we didn't have the web. But likewise, we didn't immediately perceive the importance of these discoveries, of these new inventions. So the relevant question is, what could be a radical change that may be occurring now and whose importance we don't immediately see? And I have a personal reply. In, in my opinion, this uh, big data may be marking a fundamental change in our life of scientists. And uh, I think that, uh, indeed, uh, they are the missing link between uh, uh, the fundamental theories and the modern computational power. It's true that the fundamental theories did not change much in the last 100 years. But we have uh, this enormous computational power today, which allows us to model heterogeneity in geophysical processes. But to model heterogeneity, we need information. And this information may be provided by, uh, by big data. And I would like to give a couple of examples. One is uh, the Google Global Flood Forecasting Project, uh, which is announced in that website. Basically, Google is providing for some regions of the world real-time flood alerts. This is an example of a river close to Hyderabad. And they are providing these alerts through a smartphone application, which means, uh, of course, uh, you know, the reliability of these systems, uh, it's uh, still to be proved, but they are just based on analysis of information, on analysis of big data. And I think this all also means that uh, science needs to evolve. We are dedicating a lot of time to writing papers, reviewing papers, rejecting papers, revising papers, and uh, maybe that this is not a very efficient way to use our time of scientists, uh, and the private sector moves on. So, uh, another example is the new center of uh, the ECMWF, the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting. Florian is going probably to talk about it later. That is uh, being established in Bologna in 2019. It will host the largest meteorological archive in the world. And the data handling system provides access to uh, almost 300 petabyte of primary data. And uh, it's amazing to notice that uh, the facility needs to be equipped with uh, a power, electrical power, for 10 megawatts, which is uh, being upgraded, possibly, to 20 megawatts later. So it's amazing the amount of energy that we need to store this data. So now I come to the relevant conclusion for these sessions. And uh, so, um, how to make this uh, information, this information easily accessible? How to uh, 
make sure that the studies are reproducible. When we deal with big data, the amount of information is enormous. It's not easy to store it. We usually say that cost is not a problem when we talk about digitalization, but if we look at big data, we realize that indeed we need facilities, we need energy to store them, and how to make sure that they are readily accessible. We had a, a meeting today between geoscientific societies where we discussed this issue. We discussed how to make sure that data supporting published papers are made available when we deal with a huge amount of them. I have my personal opinion. I think that it's unavoidable that we make available not only the data, but also the softwares, the models, and any algorithm that is needed to handle the data. And we need requirements, we need standards for these softwares. But, as we see, this means a radical change of our scientific activity, because currently there is no incentive for making available software and for spending time to make the software usable, easily accessible, commented, to make sure that the software has standards. But I think we really need to move forward to that. But again, this is a radical change that we are probably witnessing living now. And I stop here for now. Okay, and our last speaker before the discussion, Florian. Yeah, always, always tough to be the last one. I'm gonna stand up too, just go to my slide. <laughs> um, sort of, Alberto has already highlighted some of the issues which I'm, which I'm Oops, going to address. There we go. And now my slide is here, lucky me. Um, I, I will actually, I will actually, because at the beginning of this, we had an email discussion. One of the questions was, how do we actually have a debate about this? How do we actually disagree with each other? Um, <laughs> one of you may have started that one. And then the comment came up, as already said by the deduction, the devil's in the detail. Um, so I'm going to try to make some statements now, where I actually argue that the devil is so much in the detail that many things we're going to aspire to want with open data is close to impossible, or we are never going to be able to do that. Um, one of the things I will argue, and do argue, is that actually, with all due respect, to many of you scientists in this room, it's completely beyond you to do proper data governance because you're neither trained nor do you have the time or energy to do that and you need to employ specialists to do so. So we already have a fundamental problem there. We have data, many of you are producing data, but archiving is a different beast. Um, I will argue already, as Alberto said, it's not just about data, it's about the software. And there it becomes the problem even more severe because software to access data is one thing. It's complicated enough. Alberto already mentioned we would like to keep software code which produce data. Tough one. Um, and last but not least, Alberto mentioned already the sheer volumes we are talking about. ESMWF is an operational center, so we produce loads of data, but we are also a research institute. And as a research institute, um, our real only goal is to produce high quality weather forecasts. That's all we do, that's all we want to do, that's what we're interested in. But our researchers run every day over 100 experiments. They're producing 130 terabytes of data in a single day. Okay, there's a few of them, there's a lot of them, but there's a lot of data. Um, in addition, we're trying to make data accessible from other formats, from other communities, from other weather models. For example, we're running the WMO project on seasonal to sub-seasonal, and we're running the archive for that. In this archive is currently 11 forecasts from 11 different global centers. In there are a total of 46 variables, ranging from precipitation to temperature to wind and so forth, um, going up to 46 days, all in a unified format. This doesn't come for free. This is extremely complicated to do. This requires extremely strict data governance. This is something which takes years to evolve, and if you make a small mistake, you're going to pay for absolute decades for that. And I can give you a few examples where we got this wrong. So, in order to make really data usable in the future and truly interoperable, um, this is a complicated task. And what does this mean in practice for research? In research, it means it's a considerable effort to actually get data and make them future-proof and secure, and it has to be and is a very specialized discipline within that. Um, it's laborious, some 
argue it's exciting. Most researchers probably think it's the most boring task. We already had that as a sort of afterthought, or afterwards, often unfunded, too boring to fund, said one of you. I can't remember who it was. I think it was you, um, who wanted to fund the research but not the archiving. Um, so it's actually not that, not that simple. Um, having said that, there's loads of positive signs. Um, if you're working in European Union projects, you do know that data governance plans are standard. We do them all the time. They're part of it. Um, most research projects, even in the, in, the, in the European Union states, require that. Um, there are some countries who go so far and actually penalize you afterwards. If you haven't done it properly, you're not getting the next research project, by the way. It does happen. Um, but um, there's other answers. And one of the answers we have, or we hope to have, is, for example, the Copernicus Climate Data Store. The Copernicus Climate Data Store contains loads of data, loads of different types of data. It contains observations, historical climate data records, global and regional reanalysis, global and regional climate projections, and seasonal forecasts. And if you want to see loads of different data in action and the complexity of it, just have a go and look at it. Type in Copernicus Climate Data Store into Google or into any other of your preferred search engines, and it will come up first. Um, this store also demonstrates it's not just about the data. I really like the challenge you have, which was try to find something new in data which is already published. Um, of course, for that, you need the tools and the workflows. Mm -hmm. The Copernicus Climate Data Store actually has something which allows you to do some online programming. It's Python-based to inquire and play with those data. Um, so it's more than just having those data. It's actually also ways to explore those data. Um, Coming back to the software archiving, I think it's a really interesting and it, it valid comment. My problem with that is ECMWF produces a single new model on average every year. Um, every year we update our code, every year we update our underlying libraries, um, every year we're producing a new forecast version, which we believe brings a better forecasting system. If I go back about three, four cycles, we call them cycles, um, it's actually extremely difficult to recompile. Even if I go further back, I know it's impossible. That's because architectures of computers have changed. That's because compilers have changed. That's because underlying libraries have changed. Actually, very often I have to really admit it's impossible for me to go back. Um, it's even very costly to maintain this old software tasks to go to. And um, Alberto mentioned our move to Bologna. Part of our move to Bologna is to phase out old software because it costs us an absolute fortune to keep on the system. But this also means you will not be able to compile an old code. code. That means you will not be able to rerun an experiment. And very often, frankly, if it's purely documented, it will be very difficult for you ever to really reproduce what, how, how these data were created, simply because just reading plain lines of code doesn't always give you the, the right answer. Um, we already mentioned the sheer volume of data, and I think that is one of the key challenges. Um, some figures were, net, were mentioned. Um, um, Alberto mentioned the latest figures, there's roughly 300 petabytes, um, which is currently what we hold in our archives, but not even three years ago, or three and four years ago, roughly in 2015, this archive was only half the size. It was 140 petabytes. So within just three years, we basically just doubled that thing um, very easily. Um, if you go further back um, and just look in terms of growth, in 1995, ancient times, we produced 14 terabytes a day. In 2012, in the middle, 28 terabytes a day. Um, in 2018, so roughly today, we produce 200 terabytes a day. Um, so we're increasing the amount of data we're actually producing, which makes it extremely difficult to submit to any publication. Actually, it makes it nearly impossible unless you have a very special publication. Um, and I put up a slide here which just illustrates that's not where we're going to stop. We are going to keep growing those data archives. And what you see on this slide is today and tomorrow. Today, roughly being 2015 to 2018, this is the number of observations we are currently using in our model. Okay, we're, we're talking about 40 million here. Um, we're using 90% 90 90 of, 60 uh, 90 of 60 different satellite instruments. We're running a model with roughly 10 million grid points, 100 levels. So that's going how much goes up in the atmosphere for the non tiers. tiers. Um, 10 prognostic variables. We're running physical parameters of the atmosphere, waves, and the ocean we are producing. Tomorrow, in 2025, we have set ourselves the goal to become completely probabilistic. Um, completely probabilistic in an ensemble sense, and we're gonna use more observations. Here the number is 100, 200 million. And we're gonna use more satellites. 90% of, of over 80 different satellite instruments. I always need to look up the number because I sometimes lose it. Um, we're gonna go to a five, five kilometer grid resolution. Now currently we are about nine to 18, um, which will mean we're gonna have 500 million grid points. 
We will have 200 levels, 100 prognostic variables. We're not just going to predict the ocean and the atmosphere anymore. We're going to predict the entire Earth system. So we're going to produce even more data in the future. What does this mean for research and open data applications? That we actually can't ship those data. We need to bring the compute to the data, and therefore we need to bring cloud computing to the data, and some of that was already mentioned at the moment. Of course, that creates massive issues in terms of where we go with open data and how we treat open data and be reproducible in some sense or form. I would even go to argue that far with all what I said so far. In 10 years, most of our data will not be reproducible. We can only tell you we've used that model version, we've used those compilers, we've run on that machine infrastructure, and that's about it. You will be unlikely to go back and redo it. Um, and that's quite sad, because very often there is value in old data. There's value in, in undiscovered data. There's lots of interesting data which is actually being produced. And that, I think, finishes my statements. Thank you. <laughs> Try to be controversial. I hope it works. We just go home now. <laughs> OK, well, thank you very much, Florian. So uh, we are right on schedule. This is uh, wonderful, despite our few minute late start. So now we have some time for some moderated discussion among our panelists. And I've been jotting down notes because there was so much uh, great food for fodder. So uh, let me uh, throw up just uh, a couple uh, questions to get us started. Um, let me start with um, the first one, which I think there may be some disagreement among the panelists. That is carrot versus stick in terms of how we're going to move to um, a, a brave new future where everyone is uh, putting all of their data into um, uh, fair um, compliance. Um, Maria, you said you would like to um, make this more a um, uh, situation where we've got incentives for it. Uh, I'd love to hear from the panelists on situations where they know of major mindsets in the community being um, uh, undertaken through incentives as opposed to um, uh, a more compliant type um, framework, and what sort of uh, incentives do they think will actually get us to where we need to be? And if, if there are people on the panel that think, no, we actually need to have um, withholding of your next funding or journals not publishing your articles and um, more um, disincentives like that, I'd, I'd like to hear that as well. well so, I'll start. So it, yeah. it, 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 it's my dream that we could incentivize people to do this. But I, I, um, I'm, I'm realistic enough to know that that probably isn't going to be fully possible. Okay. Um, so uh, I, I mean, an, an, an example, uh, a couple of examples where um, um, incentivizing kind of works is, uh, you know, I know in, in my own research um, in uh, space science data with NASA, you, you basically got six months to re release a data set, okay? And that, that to me, is a fair um, amount of time to, uh, to put out a, a data set that you've looked at carefully um, and, um, and kind of gotten at least the, the biggest bugs out of. Um, but whenever we could, um, we tried to beat that six months and put it out sooner. And, um, and, um, and so there were experiments that we ran where um, there was a U.S. spacecraft, you know, ours collecting data, and then there were spacecraft from other countries. So you race data. with other countries to and get we, your data um, out faster. And guess, guess who got cited the most? Okay. Whoever gets their data out first. And whoever gets the data out first. Um, so, um, and then, then beyond that, um, if you put your data out first, I mean, people remember that. People in the community remember that. So, I mean, I expect there are people on my team, and this is probably the, the folks that, 
to really work more in the analysis mm -hmm. of creating, mm -hmm. I won't, the, you know, the, the, the data analysts. Um, you know, I believe some of those folks have gotten awards in the community because of their efforts to try to beat the, the time to get the data out faster. So that, that's one example um, where um, I think there's a, just an incentivization. And, and the other one, um, really the Human Genome Project, you know, which was, was yeah. all open. And you know, obviously the, the benefits there were, were just extraordinary. So, um, so uh, like I said, in a perfect world, um, that's the way we do it. But, um, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, you know that there's multiple groups going after the same discovery, um, there's going to be a real disincentive there to, um, to put things out quickly unless you know you've kind of gotten the You want. Yeah. yeah. You want. And I'll let some others comment on that. Yeah. I'm happily starting. I'm, I'm, actually, I'm actually having a more positive mindset, I have to admit, because I actually believe most data people want to share their data. Most people are proud of their data, and uh, maybe just for citations or any other reason, but they're actually proud of what they've produced. Um, still, sometimes they stick them into formats which is difficult, and they're not mm -hmm. entirely open and easily okay. accessible. So what are they missing? They're missing an infrastructure. So yes. the carrot is actually not. Yes penalizing them. The card is, if you put it there, it will be accessible to everybody. Oh, yeah. And we have many projects like this at the moment, which is great. Um, so I actually think the incentive doesn't have to be that high. I know there's areas where this is not necessarily the case, where people don't want to share, but I do think majority of people who do research are happy to share data. Um, maybe not always code and software. Yeah, I, I'm happy to say Something, first of all, I want to start with a positive uh, uh, reflection. If we look back 10 years ago, nobody was sharing data. And uh, it was uh, almost a, a practice because, uh, you know, people were jealous about the data, they wanted to keep them. Today, the situation is radically changed. And uh, uh, I think the key was the fact that several journals, they asked for the data to be uh, made available before the paper is published. And I'm firmly convinced that if we want to to give a valid incentive to that, we have to change our system for academic assessment, for assessment of uh, scholar publications. Okay. So if we recognize the effort of young scientists for doing something, they will do that. If we don't recognize the effort of uh, young people to produce the data, make the software available, we don't get anywhere. Yeah. This is my, I, I, I know that it's not easy, but uh, I think we need to move forward along this way. Yeah, I want to, oh, oh, go ahead, Murray. Just to follow up on that, I think one of the, the main things that I come across is that there's, it's a cultural shift that needs to happen. Um, I think universities and promotion and tenure boards really need to fully embrace this idea that data and data, um, development of data sets is just as important as um, you know, the interpretation. As Marsha, you said, what I, what I interpreted at the time was the best um, uh, interpretation at the time because of what the data we had. Mm -hmm. Now, your data is probably way more important so that it can mm -hmm. be used to forward um, most of the, the fields. So I think really we need to start thinking about that kind of approach. And I also think that um, this idea of team science has really changed um, the landscape. You don't really see as many folks doing their own thing by themselves anymore because at least in the fields that I'm associated with, you can't do it by yourself. Yeah. You need different data sets and so you need to be able to do that. So we need to be able to reward that. And I think you know through citations, through um, being able to in, um, host the infrastructure and the access and give credit where that is due. Is, is important. Sure. I, I am very much happy to hear uh, so those views that they are really harmonize what I have been thinking. Uh, the, my idea could be some extension of your, uh, what you are thinking about that. Uh, the, my, my idea is uh, so the issue should be a uh, so change of the ecosystem, change of the research ecosystem, change of the researcher ecosystem, 
And uh, yeah, currently people are, uh, are rushing to publish the papers, and the paper, papers are you know currency of the science. And uh, now the uh, we are uh, some people are trying to change so that kind of evaluation system. The once the data uh, can be you know, subject to the uh, research evaluation, uh, so research behavior should be changed. Uh, the, what we should do is really uh, the the uh, the items or uh, output which is important for science must be correctly evaluated. A data is so, software is so, uh, facilities so, or other know-how, other uh, any properties mm -hmm. or so. Uh, once so, uh, we can change uh, uh, in that way the, uh, the we can target the more healthy science ecosystem. And, uh, and the extension of that is uh, that sharing the data with the society uh, could build uh, so mutual trust or worthy, trust, trustworthiness between science and society. And uh, going digital is, uh, in my sense, uh, some, in some part risky, you know. Uh, storing data, uh, storing uh, software always costs the time. Uh, more than the paper, more than the, just the printing. So uh, we have to be careful about the, what investment needs to be for that. And uh, in my sense that the, uh, uh, I don't want to use the research money to store the data, uh, the huge size of data. Uh, the data, digital infrastructure should be the societal infrastructures. That sense, uh, uh, we should uh, ask the society to invest to the uh, our common infrastructure of the digital data. Once that you know, science is uh, part of that kind of societal infrastructure, uh, that we can live uh, more easier in the landscape. So let me um, tee off something that Florian said at the beginning, and that is, um, I do agree with him that I think people really want to get their data out there. They want to see it used. They want to see it cited. Um, they want to see other people benefiting from it. But sometimes there are um, small barriers that get in the way of that. And I want to recommend to people a report that the National Academy put out just, um, oh, I, I think it was maybe six months ago, and it's called Open by Design. And um, the report actually advocates for um, a fundamental change in how we're looking at open science, um, starting from a cultural change of how we collect data to begin with and how we look at our research teams to begin with, such that um, pressing that button at the end to make your data available is such an easy thing to do because your whole um, design of your experiment from start to finish was conceived with an open science viewpoint and, and framework um, so that those little barriers that might have stopped you at the end from saying, oh, it's gonna be difficult for me to make this data open or to send it to the repository. I didn't put it in the right format. I don't have the right metadata or whatever. None of those barriers are there because it was designed with the open science um, to begin with. So I, I also like the um, tenor of your answers here about um, changing the incentive system uh, within the research community to recognize what Maria and I both said. You know, we, we see that um, uh, interpretations come and go um, in response to more information, more minds looking at the data, um, but that that doesn't seem to be rewarded um, from the standpoint of us being rewarded for having made our data available as much as us being rewarded for having had a certain paper and a certain journal that got so many citations. We aren't being rewarded for our data being reused or our data being necessarily cited. Um, how do, how do you on the panel actually see this change in the reward system happening? Is this going to be an evolution? Is it going to be a revolution? Which university is going to stand up first and say, we promoted this faculty member not because of his or her number of 
um, publications in so many journals, but because of these well-curated data sets that led to all these discoveries by perhaps other people. <laughs> I can tell you what I think as a personal. <laughs> yes, um, Maria. I, I actually think um, I would applaud that university that did that. Um, I think we are in a time where this whole science enterprise is changing, okay? We are not doing science the way we did it in the 1500s or the 1800s or in 1900s. Um, we've got much more team science, right? Because a lot of the things we're doing, I mean, when you have big data and you have, you, you, it's not one person that does that. Um, and so there's, there's a, an issue there of, you know, how do I rate a, a, an assistant professor who's 15th author on a 25 authored paper and I can't tell you know what their contribution was well welcome to team science um, so there needs to be a whole fundamental shift in how those evaluations are done and I think we need to recognize that the contribution of a data set is just as important as you said as a um, 500,000 cited um, paper um, and I also think that the university who also puts together the inter and transdisciplinary type approaches so that's not siloed is also a thing that needs to happen. So, you know, more things that we can track and better metrics, I think we are really stuck on um, really ancient metrics on how to do this. And so I think the, the whole enterprise needs to look at that and say, you know, what is reality now? not what it was 25 years ago. Can I say yes, something? Yes, yes, yeah. please, Alberta. You know, currently, our system for academic assessment is not decided by universities, it's not decided by scientists, it's decided by someone who gets a good idea, and then the university, the government, whatever, they pick it up. And I think that it's us that we scientists have to develop the idea and propose a new system for academic recognition. It's time that uh, you know, we take uh, the leverage of, uh, of uh, our uh, academic promotions uh, and the recognition in general. And not only for what uh, concerns the open data or the big data. We know that uh, the peer review system, how it's con conceived now, will collapse uh, very soon, will change. Not, will collapse is not the right word, will change. And uh, we know that there are several limitations in the current system of recognition which stimulates young scientists to salami publishing, uh, to incremental publishing. So we, I think we really need a step change and it's, uh, I think it's a task of the scientific association that need to get together and elaborate an idea. And this is my hope. And uh, I, I think there are several ideas on the table now, even for the publishing system, because as I said, uh, there are several limitations in the peer review as we use it now. And my hope is that indeed we as scientific association have the power, the energy, and the ideas for uh, getting proactive and to make a proposal. And then I think the universities will pick it up if we are able to elaborate good solutions. Can I just quickly jump back on that for a second? Oh, sure. Um, I also, I agree with you, but I also think that it has to be a full cultural change of the entire community because those are the people who are you're in your part so you i think we need to to recognize that the old way is really stifling a lot of innovation um, and i think a lot of it needs to come from the community itself um, either from the a, a university a department a society the uh, national academies or whatever but it actually needs to be us that does that and not one particular group Oh, I, I agree because it has to come from the people who are writing the letters of recommendation. It has to come from the uh, peer panels who are looking at those. It has to it has to come through the whole system. Yeah, yeah, yeah Maria. Yeah. So, um, so some fields have figured out how to do this. <laughs> okay, um, you know, high energy physics routinely uh, the publications come out with 600 or so, you know, authors. Right. 
and um, and um, and the uh, the senior members of those communities know exactly how to write a letter that says author number 235 this experiment would not have happened if author number 235 had not made this contribution to that okay mm -hmm. and um, and in the um, I mean in the recent I mean we just gave a Nobel Prize for a measurement right, right. for the detection of a gravitational wave that was a paper that had a thousand uh, mm -hmm. authors right. on it yeah. and uh, you know, the right three got the, the, the prize, but all those other people are, are, um, are being rewarded um, in their careers. And, but I, I wanna point out um, uh, an article that just got emailed me today, so from Inside Higher Ed, and it's a, a study on the rise of uh, the number of uh, first authored publications by PhDs. And, um, and it, uh, the number has, plummeted, so now, um, you know, PhDs out for some period of time are only first author on a publication 40% of the time, okay, as, as opposed it used to be up over 85%. And, uh, and, you know, there was a lot of uh, buzz going on about, oh, this means people aren't getting jobs, okay. But what it's really meaning is, is that there's team science and, and papers are being written with a whole lot of authors, and so people aren't being first authors, but it's not to say that they're not making really important contributions. And, um, and, I, and for the vitality and actually the future of our science, we need to make sure that we figure out uh, a system so that we can reward the contributions um, of these folks. And, I, and I'm actually fairly optimistic that that could happen. I mean, it, need, it, it means you're not gonna be able to give the same weight to letters from senior people sometimes who yeah. lived in a different world and don't rec make yeah. those recognitions. Well, um, at the expense of shamelessly promoting my own paper in PNAS, <laughs> <laughs> um, we did publish, I think it was earlier this year, maybe earlier this year, um, a paper um, with a number of co-authors that um, actually um, advocated for uh, a mechanism of authorship much more akin to movie credits. Where, because you look at movie credits and you have, you have no doubt about, you know, who was the producer, who was the director, who was the key grip, whatever that means, you know, <laughs> and uh, who did the set design and whatever. And so there are lots of people involved but you know exactly what everyone did for it, even though you have a cast of a thousand. Whereas you look at a scientific paper, and you know that the last author on a biology paper is very different than the last author on a geoscience paper. So you, it's totally inside baseball and sometimes totally opaque who did what. So this paper is, is advocating that we change our system. So, sure. Uh, so please let me come back to a little bit to so smaller point issue that the yeah a change of yeah uh, culture change of the uh, so scientific associations are, are really important that's I totally agree and uh, right now uh, community has uh, doesn't have the experience of the how we can evaluate the data output the for instance in the atmospheric science of my experience that's, that's uh, for instance, uh, balloons on the data, which is, you know, meteorological authorities are uh, uh, doing the every day. Uh, and the, those data are not really uh, uh, subject for the authorship. So every meteorologist is uh, very much easy to open the, the data. Uh, however, the, uh, if we think about uh, some sub-millimeter sub uh, heterodyne uh, spectrometers data to resolve the, some atmospheric chemical species, uh, which is worth uh, promoting the professor uh, if once that data is in the, uh, the scientist's uh, yeah, uh, publication list or achievement list. So the uh, community needs the experience of the, what kind of data needs to, uh, must be in, in, uh, evaluated in what way. So uh, uh, in that sense, uh, community consensus or association uh, experiences are really important for now. All right, thanks. 
So um, let me go on to the next question. Um, several people have mentioned the software environment. And in fact, I've had many people say to me, to preserve, um, I mean, the, the data can have a value um, beyond um, your particular paper. But if you actually want to reproduce a paper, to have uh, preserved the data and not the software, um, it's, it's, it's very difficult to actually reproduce um, the study. I, I remember I, I got a very hard lesson in the importance of the software environment um, when I was a very young scientist. I had just finished my PhD, and I had moved from Scripps Institution of Oceanography to the University of Minnesota. And before I left, I called up the U of M and I said, what kind of computer do you have there? And I'd been working on a CDC at Scripps, and they said they had a CDC. So I thought, ah, no problem. My um, software, my data will all run on the CDC. So I get to the University of Minnesota, nothing runs, nothing works. I find out they have a different compiler there. It wasn't at all the same compiler. Um, and so I thought, crap, I won't be able to do, pick up my research where I left off. I don't know what to do. It wouldn't even read my tapes. Well, fortunately, Minnesota is CDC land home of control data. So I called up CDC and I said, um, hello, I just moved here um, and I'm a young assistant professor and I um, uh, have all these tapes that I wrote on one CDC computer and I'm trying to read them on another one and it won't work, what are you gonna do about it? <laughs> so um, they assigned a team to fix it for me and they did. They rewrote all my tapes so that they would work on the new compiler. So I was back in business in like three days. But that doesn't always happen. So um, the, um, the issue here is um, the, we, we wrote a, a paper in um, Sciences Policy Forum about this issue of how does one preserve the software environment? Not just the software, but the software environment for reproducibility, and should there be a statute of limitations on that? Because obviously one cannot hope to preserve it forever, but should there be some statute of limitations? Thoughts? I, because I, I, I made this point earlier, I think I'm just coming, I'm coming straight back to that. Statute of limitation is <clears throat> an interesting thought, but of course we're externally driven here. We're driven by new te tech or new computing technology, and when we buy a new HPC, your study will expire more or less immediately because we're going to buy a new HPC, mm -hmm. full stop. Um, I think one just has to accept that this is not ever going to be, is not an achievable, easily achievable goal. Ironically, I think with the development of carny of technology, with the container technologies, there may be actually a chance more than ever than there may have been in the past. To be yeah. fair. Um, however, having said that, I don't think it's an achievable goal. And there's, there's one other slight nagging issue which I have in there is very often that I can't, I cannot publish all my code because I actually don't own it. That is part of team science. Right. Mm -hmm. Team science means I don't have all yep. the IPR. Yep. Team science means it belongs to somebody completely different who may have of us whatever reasons not being prepared to publish it or can't publish it for other reasons. Yep. Um, so we do have an intrinsic problem there that I think the best we can do is describe the version. We can describe as closely as possible what we have. We can publish what we can publish but also have to fundamentally accept we're not going to reach the holy grail there. Yeah, so I, th I mean, I think it's interesting to ask the question about what, what's your responsibility with mm -hmm. regard to software? Because I, I mean, I had a situation once where somebody wrote a program to do a calculation and then compared it to something that I had done and got a different answer. And they sent me a note and said, uh, can I have your code? So. I dug, you know, in the you know, warehouse and in all your free time, the zip disk with, yeah. the, with this, you know, Fortran 77 program on it, and uh, sent it. And they says, "Well, I need the MATLAB version, right?" <laughs> it wasn't invented, then. And, uh, which which so, doesn't uh, exist. Which doesn't exist. So um, so obviously I couldn't comply. But yeah. um, it, you know, they, I mean, there there are going to yeah. be statute of right. limitations. 
and they're not going to be 10 year statute of limitations. Yeah, yeah, right, right, exactly. All right. So um, let me uh, get on to the um, uh, next one I had, and that is um, I like this idea of this new cadre of data specialists um, that I think we're all going to have to be thinking about in terms of part of our team in team science, uh, people who are going to um, make uh, sure that uh, the data uh, complies with fair standards, um, that um, actually focus on the quality of the data, um, data um, uh, calibration standards, et cetera. Um, uh, what are your thoughts about where these people are going to come from? Are they going to come from out of our disciplinary domains, or are they going to come from elsewhere within the academic community? I, I have to frankly say I think they exist. Okay, I think we have them already, yeah. and we have quite a few of them, actually, to be fair. Mm -hmm. I think what's been missing sometimes is the link from those to train those others. And that's mm -hmm. where I find this the challenge in my institution. Others right. might find so it. there's not the connection so that they can reproduce themselves? The connection or the motivation or the incentives that we briefly talked about. Mm -hmm. I think there's loads of reasons why this connect doesn't happen. Yeah. 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 Oh, so I, I would just note that MIT just announced um, the formation of a college of computing um, with the, the idea that um, uh, it will be um, partially people who are practitioners in computer science who write code and then, um, and then links to departments all over campus, including the humanities and social sciences, for practitioners who want to use those codes and, and be trained in using these state-of-the-art codes and, and be able to access them and know that they exist as soon as possible. So I, I think that's going to facilitate, but I, I agree with Florian that, you know, our researchers have picked up these skills, you know, as they have come along, and the, the key is that we need a lot more of those people, and, and this is one way, and there can be other ways of, of how we expand the numbers and make sure that they have the training, that they're, that they're really doing state-of-the-art coding work as opposed to just writing some, you know, code that hopefully works, you know, so. And I think from a, a funder's point of view, and again, this is not the uh, National Science Foundation's um, idea, but uh, this is my personal opinion, um, that I really think that we need to recognize the fact that the data part is an integral part of the, the whole science. This is an integral part of the project. It's not a afterthought. And so it needs to be given as much support um, from the beginning. In addition, it should be encouraged that when the proposals are written, they're written exactly as you had said before about what I'm going to do with this when I'm done with it. And once we start to change that kind of approach, we will have more support, I think, for those critical um, people. And I really think it's also an exciting new kind of approach for um, graduate students to go into. I mean, not everybody wants to be, um, you know, the, the principal investigator on this, that, or the other thing, but they want to be involved in maybe a variety of different things. And these are the kinds of things that we can, we can do and, and to promote that. And I think it's up to universities and funding agencies to, you know, say, this, this is a, a critical part of our science enterprise and we need to support it. Okay. So I want people in the audience to start thinking of their questions because I'm going to ask one more of the panel and then open it up to all of you for your questions. So my last question to you is about data repositories. Uh, we've got um, a variety of data repositories. The only one I know of for sure that is international and internationally funded by commingle funds is the ocean drilling program, yep. though there may be others. Um, so, but, but yet there are many problems that span um, borders. Uh, certainly 
just about everything in the ocean and everything in the atmosphere and uh, many other things uh, that have to do with um, chemical cycles and things like that. Um, so um, I'd love to hear your thoughts about um, whether national domain repositories are um, perfectly acceptable as long as they are interoperable and have all adopted the same metadata standards? And if so, um, who is creating the metadata standards and are they all um, compatible? And um, what, what do you think about some of these other um, repositories that have sprung up like Figshare and Dataverse and uh, even some journals um, have repositories for data from that they have published. Um, what are the pros and cons of some of these models, international, national domain, and um, uh, ones that are um, sort of um, potpourri, for want of a, another term? Yeah, Alberto. Yeah. Um it's a topical issue, and uh, I agree there are currently several repositories that are made available by uh, journals uh, and uh, scientific association in some cases, and there are some university institutions that are managing their own repository. I, I think it is difficult to generalize. I think that when we are talking about uh, uh, big data, we need something that is really structured. And when we are talking about um, other um, data limited uh, scientific uh, publication or scientific results, uh, probably it's easier to self-organize. What I think we need is quality standards and quality standards that should be internationally recognized. So I'm thinking at something like an ISO rule or uh, something like that that should uh, give uh, precise standards for quality check and uh, for security of the data, data security. Because, of course, uh, it's an issue, the fact that this data, we, we always consider that digital data are perennial. They are not, indeed. For in, I, I would say that probably paper is more enduring than a digital data. And therefore, we need to make sure that uh, there is a, a a quality assurance that preserves uh, the duration of the data in the very long future. So in, in summary, my reply would be, I think that we need international standards. And then depending on the amount of data that is being stored, I think that uh, there, might be, uh, uh, there might be a hierarchical set of solutions from the more structured ones to uh, the smaller repositories. But I don't have a clear idea. I, I confess that, you know, it's, it's a very topical uh, issue. Lauren? I think, there's, I, think there's a few, I think there's a few positive things. And I think there are, for example, domain-specific yes. data standards. WMO famously has something called the GRIP standard. Not everybody might like it, but it's actually a domain-specific standard which works. Um, mm. Disadvantage is, as a researcher, it may take you six months to get your GRIP code to actually archive what you want to archive, okay? There's a disadvantage there too. Um, in terms of data repositories, I, I do think we actually have currently a plethora of them. There's actually, a, there, there's, I don't know, in, in, the, in Europe, every H2020 project seems to have a data portal, and it just drives me nuts because there's another data portal coming up, and then they're connecting to each other, whatever. Um, so I think it only will work if it's really usage or if it's objectively driven on what I want to do with those data. I think there's a real, maybe, I don't know, know nothing about the ocean drilling program, but it seems to me it has an objective, which is storing the ocean drilling data. Um, we have an objective to store atmospheric data. And maybe that's just easier. We just need to work our way up from there and trying to make them interconnectable. Because other organizations like OGZ, which standards, loads of things. Um, mm -hmm. So these standards do exist. Unfortunately, they're not everywhere. Unfortunately, they're not always interoperable. And I don't think I go without better. I don't think there's actually a, there's no clear-cut answer. At least I can't see one. Maybe one of you can. Does, do, do any of you know of situations where someone has gone into any of these large domain data repositories and um, confirmed the quality of the data in them? <laughs> yes. Actually, I can point to um, Australia as a um, 
a guiding light in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. Basically, one of the things, and Leslie can talk to this more, but she showed us um, a couple weeks ago where they've taken all of the data sets that they have for land um, use and been able to not move them, but link them by an overlying um, basic uh, structure where you can go in and query and it tells you exactly where things are. Mm -hmm. And so I think there are ways to do that. I think we're always gonna find that the landscape is very different because if you're dealing with huge big data like that or you're looking at the long tail of science for mm -hmm. you know small, smaller things, um, there has to be a different um, set of ways to get at it. But mm -hmm. I think if there's um, ways to promote the interoperability between data sets mm -hmm. um, and domain science um, standards, then that's a big step forward. Right. Um, because then you don't have to know exactly, you know, what it is. I want this data from here. I want that data from here. And let's let's yeah. put those things. Because I love that um, Florian talked about um, uh, that repositories have data standards, but the question is, is anyone um, actually enforcing those data standards, and does anyone check for them? Uh, because you can imagine someone coming years later and using the data. And uh, you know, it used to be back in the dark ages when the community was very small and everyone knew everyone. You, you basically intrinsically knew which scientists collected really, really good data and could be trusted to have really good quality control and which scientists um, were pretty sloppy and you didn't want to trust their data. And just one example I'll give you uh, was years ago um, in San Francisco at the AGU meeting, um, a, a scientist and his students went through the National Geophysical um, Data um, uh, Archive uh, that uh, NOAA runs. And they looked at all the underway geophysical data. And they did a crossover analysis where two ship tracks would cross the same place of the ocean. And um, since it was the same spot, um, theoretically they should get the same depth of the ocean and they should get the same gravity field because magnetic field is time varying. Uh, you wouldn't expect that to be the same. And they did um, the crossover analysis as a function of which institution's ships were crossing which one. And they found that in general, there was good agreement um, for regardless of which institution was A and which institution was B, with the exception of one institution which was always out of line with whichever one it crossed. That institution, NSF, took away their ship based on that analysis and told them they could, they, they, their data quality was so bad they didn't deserve to have a ship. It's quite it's a really interesting example. I think we have a slightly, it's quite interesting because I think we have a slightly different understanding of what a data archive is. Um, I don't see a data archive as a repository of files. I see a data archive is something that can inquire data. And when you have to inquire data and manipulate data, you automatically are sort of forced into keeping them much closer to standard because you couldn't do that. You couldn't intersect. What you just described in intersect, mm -hmm. I would like to do, that's part of the data archive infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So if they couldn't, if you couldn't inquire the data properly, then that would be a problem. Having said that, within the WMO system, we do have issues with data quality. We do have issues with coding. And what happens usually, those data get blacklisted and not put into the archiving system and mm -hmm. get reported back. Mm -hmm. But I understand where you're coming from. I, just, I would just wish that a data archive would do more than just serve you data. Yeah, yeah, gotcha. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, it, 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 it could be that so a workflow issue, yeah. let's say, yeah. So, uh, it depends on size and depends on the curation levels. And, uh, uh, are they, when it is automized, uh, as you said, it can be done. Yeah. Uh, automated uh, data flow on the in the social sciences and the relatively small science or web data uh, we need the handmade curation uh, annotation and and uh, maybe in the future vision is uh, uh, so every data repository connected federated and over the internet and uh, we can see the distributed data systems over that so, yeah. 
So I'd like to open this up to people from the audience. Uh, Brooks, yeah, uh, come on. Why, why don't people just go ahead and line up at the microphone um, and then we can get questions. So yeah, my question being is this on? <laughs> yeah. Yep. I can't see it. Yeah, I know. So, so my <laughs> question's for uh, Marsha, the Marias, and Florian. And the reason uh, Alberto and, and Murray, I'm off the hook. Uh, so Brooks Hansen needs you. So my question is, what would you like to see societies, scientific societies, together? Um, and that's why Alberto and, and Mariam Hassan are off the hook, since we're having this conversation, do to make a difference here. And I'd like to, to put one thing off the table, which is uh, awards. I think awards are good for raising visibility. Uh, but we have like a climate communication award, which is great for raising the visibility there, but it doesn't it doesn't affect everyone. It affects some people, and it, and it doesn't change the whole culture, and, and you know, we can certainly do that. But aside from that, and we can't take away ships either, so aside from those, um, what would you like positive or negative uh, societies, the leading societies, to do, or the, the, most, the single most important thing to help this along? It's a conversation we're having. Well, I can start out. I mean, one thing that I see scientific societies already doing in spades are through their journals program, they're um, requiring uh, data to be open and deposited. They're um, pushing for data citation standards. I think that's really important that data sets have URLs so that they can be tracked and that sort of thing. I think that's uh, really important. Um, some um, scientific societies are even starting data journals that are um, uh, domain specific so that people can um, describe just a really good interesting data set and make it very clear that the data set is available. Uh, here's how it's collected um, so that people are aware that that data set's available, where to find it, uh, everything about it. I, I think very often sometimes you know, Maria and I have both had this uh, situation that um, journals are more interested in your glitzy interpretation of the data set and um, they sort of cut all the um, uh, sort of laborious description of um, the collection of the data set and there should be some place where that can be published. So, Maria, do you yeah, have? No, I, I, I agree completely. I mean, the, the journals can set standards. I mean, the, the idea that you could cite a data set and that that would have a URL and that would count as a, as a publication that could be cited, I, I, think, uh, I think would be huge. Um, you know, at places like meetings like this, I mean, you could highlight um, uh, in, you know, either through a, a special section or a lecture, um, yeah. uh, you know, analysis methods for data, you know, visualization methods for data, you know, I mean, there's a, a lot of ways that you could look at this that would draw attention and draw interesting people to be attracted to them. Oh yeah, visualization, so important. I mean, I think that um, one, one great way that you can actually tell whether data sets have problems with big data is through visualization. So promoting um, projects that help with visualization of data is so important. And sessions like this would be great for, um, for visualization of data. I think you'd pack people in for sessions that help people learn how to visualize their data. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think it is indeed extremely important that scientific societies uh, try to agree a strategy. And it's not easy. It's not easy because uh, uh, among scientific societies there is competition, which is st a stimulating competition. It's a sane competition. So I'm, I'm not saying that this is bad, but on the other hand, uh, we should try to converge to a common strategy, which means that uh, uh, in, in, in some cases we have to give a higher priority to a joint strategy with respect to competition. And uh, also, you know, if we, if we think about publication, uh, any scientific society is interested in getting papers published. And again, this is a good thing uh, because uh, the measure of uh, the success of a publication is also the number of papers, the citation, the impact factor. But on the other hand, uh, we have to also give priority to the quality of the papers uh, in terms uh, of data availability and data standards. So 
This requires uh, giving priority to it, and I think it is important that the scientific societies uh, working on a specific field work together on that, because it's, you know, today the problem is global. It's, it's not a local problem. We need to, to tackle the problem by adopting a global strategy. So again, I am convinced that the scientific association can do a lot on that. So what I, in the spirit of that, I think what I would like to see is, I think where, where we fall down is that we put our graduate students through and we don't necessarily teach them how to do um, data management, data literacy. And I think this is one of the things that if we all have this common goal, then this is something that the societies could actually come together to do. And I think it, it's not a, a huge part if we could get um, some module training modules. You know, we run workshops, we do webinars, we do those kinds of things. And if there's a way for um, EGU, AGU, GSA, you know, all of the acronym soup to say this data part is important, we're here to help educate that, um, I think that would be a big step forward. And we wouldn't, hopefully, in 15 years, have to come back to this discussion. Good. All right. Next question. Hi, thanks. Um, I'm an ecologist. I study how butterflies are affected by climate and land use change. This is my first time at an AGU meeting. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to bring up a topic that um, I didn't hear you guys address, and that is support for citizen science observatory networks. <laughs> and I, I can speak a lot about that from the biodiversity standpoint. Um, and it's very complicated, but I'll just say that uh, more and more we're realizing we need structured survey data that collects abundances, uh, effort, at a space, very large spatiotemporal replication, which is only possible through citizen science. I work on butterflies, there's a lot of good stuff out there for birds, but even that is mostly just for opportunistic data, like if someone sees something cool, they're gonna take a picture of it and upload it to iNaturalist. I run a program, I'm an assistant professor at Georgetown, I run a program called Pollard Base that serves a network of butterfly monitoring programs where people do structured surveys, they go out to the same transect, week after week, the same person, and the only reason I run that is because I need those data, and since I launched that program in 2014, the number of state-based programs like Illinois, Ohio, Texas, mm -hmm. has quadrupled. Um, and talk about no reward. Nobody cares that I have a system out there that right. serves thousands of volunteers. Mm -hmm. And so I wanna talk about funding and what uh, one of the gentlemen up there said about how the infrastructure should be a social cost is huge, and I'm just gonna say from my experience, I try to come up with a business model for my platform. First of all, the data have to be free, right? Which is pretty unfair. These are not publicly funded data. Um, there's no dedicated infrastructure. It's very hard to get funding. The data to make these data actually interoperable requires overcoming barriers that people are bored with, like reconciling names. Sorry, it's boring, but it's still super important, even more important now. And when I ask people at NSF what I should do to support my program, which literally supports a huge amount of North American butterfly data monitoring, they always tell me to hook up with a rich foundation funder, which means I'm looking for a sugar daddy or a sugar mama. Any in the audience would be great, but it's always kind of ticks me off because I feel like that should not be the answer. And even that is only temporary funding. So to me, we're relying more and more on the citizen science data and we do not have the infrastructure or the programs to support it. Yeah, so an Excel spreadsheet is not your solution. No. <laughs> You're so. all looking at me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll take a crack at it. So you're right. Um, and I was, it didn't shock me that um, NSF told you that this is not something they fund. Um, and that is basically because of the, the mandate that we have. Um, but I also think that um, this, I don't want to say that the, the fundamental research that NSF funds needs to change. What I'm saying is that we need to have partnerships with other groups that make things so it's not um, very difficult for groups who want to do this kind of approach, taking the, 
basic science and putting it into practice. And I think from the Belmont point of view, that is kind of why we've gotten 29 countries to come together that are NSF agency, like agencies to come to do those kinds of things. Um, we are in our infancy in terms of creating those partnerships. Um, but I do think one of the things that funding agencies will listen to is community. So if there is a big push from your community, don't sit by yourself. You know, start to collaborate, get people together, come together and say, this is important and this is a critical part of the research enterprise that we're looking to do. And you know, you have to be willing to take a little bit from here, a little bit from there to put, put that together, but that doesn't mean that people should, you know, necessarily slam the door in your face. Um, so I do understand your frustration, but there are some programs out there that can help you do that. It's just a matter of really understanding that funding landscape, which unfortunately is changing all the time. Right, and I'll just quickly say that I do tap into those funding sources pretty well, or I wouldn't have the system. Right. But I do think there just needs to be more institutional support for those kinds of systems, and there's no one place that really supports that other than, I mean, I understand NSF is a research funding agency, right. so unless there's a underlying research issue, it's hard to get it funded. Um, and there's just some basic stuff that needs to be supported that, you know, the problems are already solved. Right. We just need some sort of infrastructure system out there. I mean, my only suggestion would be if it, if your project can be an integral part of a fundamental research problem, then then you can make that link between them. Um, and again, that is sort of that thought process from taking fundamental research into, I would say, more actionable or solutions-oriented um, approaches. I, just just yeah. to add to that, I, I know nothing about butterflies apart from that they cause <laughs> chaos in atmospheric models. <laughs> um, <laughs> but let's go beyond that. Um, I think you are sort of it's quite interesting because I think citizen science at the moment is a big thing and um, citizen science Support. is, you're sort, of, you're sort of penalized by being on the cutting edge of, of the science here because there are citizen science observations which do actually have repositories and have stringent standards. Um, I'm thinking of private metallurgical stations, for example, where there are certain commercial companies who act, seem to be able to do that at the moment. So there's currently still an unevenness, and it always, I do, I think from my personal perspective, I just see that maybe the system is still, there still needs some space to it actually to settle, um, yeah. to settle to a sort of sort of common understanding of what this really means. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't just go, as you know, from, from the, it doesn't go just from data format or standard, it goes to private data protection and so forth. It's a hugely complex, and I think this is why you, I know nothing about American funding, um, why it's currently probably quite difficult to even, even think of how to address it in a, in a wider sense. But there are areas out there where this is consolidated. All right, let's go to the next question. Um, all right, so seismologists love to compliment themselves about adopting decades ago what would be called fair data practices today. And um, the facile answer to that is, well, the IRIS consortium. But if you try to dig a little bit deeper, some people say, well, it's a technological thing. The data are very uniform and simple to distinguish from products. Or sometimes people answer, it's an economic uh, answer, that uh, the data acquisition systems are not affordable by individual scientists, but could be created by the National Science Foundation and sharing the data is a is a criterion for access to those. There are other hypotheses going back to the history of seismology and, for example, the creation of the International Seismological Center in 1970, funded by NSF, the Russian Academy of Sciences, the Japan Meteorological Agency, and others. And I, I guess my comment, well, Marsha, you started off with this question. You said, are there examples of uh, good data sharing in the in the past? And Maria gave a couple of uh, of exam Maria Zuber gave a couple of examples. Uh, NASA data, mm -hmm. human genome data. I'd love to see a panel that uh, includes historians of science who might do comparisons among disciplines, the features of them, and uh, and how effective they've been at uh, data sharing in the past to mm -hmm. inform how we go forward. Yeah. Of course. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good. Good comment. Thank you. Okay. Next question. 
Uh, I'm a graduate student from University of Michigan, so I want to discuss a little bit, uh, share one comment uh, from the perspective of a graduate student, <laughs> and also like have a question. So uh, uh, first, uh, I'm a member of the IEE Geoscience and Remote Sensing Society, and we have a subcommittee like called Standards in Earth Observation. So we have form, formed different groups to uh, write standards and to standard that the uh, format of the data, and uh, uh, for different satellite uh, uh, systems like radiometer, radar, and other systems. So this is a good sign, but in reality, there are a lot of quite problems. So one of my senior colleagues in this society, uh, also in University of Michigan, so he has a bigger plan to write a uh, one million Python codes one, one million lines of Python codes to read all SAR data, uh, like any format from any sensor. But uh, after five years of his volunteer work, uh, he only completed about 10% of that. And it's very hard to get uh, graduate students involved. So one pr problem is like for computer science, uh, teach student, computer science students, they do not know these data sets, how they are created, uh, what's the difference between them. But for some students like us, we do not know uh, how to write these codes. I mean, we are not uh, computer scientists. So my comment is like, uh, it may be helpful for like a geo, uh, larger society to form such uh, subcommittees and to include students and scientists from different uh, fields and also data scientists. Uh, uh, and uh, then we can work together to develop these standards. And uh, just one uh, uh, tiny question is like, uh, for these, all these data satellite, uh, system, satellite systems, I mean the calibration and the instrumentation, they are the fundamental of the uh, data set. I mean, but uh, like for different countries, they have diff different limitation about how uh, the level that they can release about this instrumentation and the calibration process. I mean, uh, is there any uh, thoughts like how to uh, push uh, this? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay. I, yeah, go ahead. I, I think there's always an issue with data provenance. There's always an issue how data have been processed and how to get to data. And we know, we know that different countries process data differently. Radar data comes to my mind, which is quite an obvious example. And um, it's not always convenient to make raw data available. Satellites are post-processed too, most of them, to be really fair, um, before it can be used to them. Um, I don't think there's an, there's an obvious answer. Everybody would like to have access to raw data, but they also want to have the post-process product. Okay. So I'm not really going to, I'm not able to give you an answer. Sorry. Yeah. The same for me. Yeah. All right. Okay. okay. Next question. Um, hello. Um, I found the concept of team science very enlightening. Uh, this idea that we reward uh, individual contributions that may extend beyond simply the kind of uh, mastermind intellectual uh, contributions. And when I think about um, some of the big examples we have right now of um, data reuse uh, advancing science, they are generated from these uh, big science or team science type projects. However, if we go down into the poster hall uh, here, the vast majority of projects are still done by small groups. Um, and I can't necessarily think of examples to tell my colleagues uh, of you know, smaller scale day-to-day uh, -day science that has really benefited from uh, data reuse or data sharing. So, uh, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, how do we basically provide examples to our scientific colleagues of how the smaller scale data sharing and data reuse are helping to benefit science and science discovery? I, um, sure. I'd Go love ahead. to jump yeah. in on that sure. one. Thanks for the question, Riley. <laughs> um, I would say that it depends on the field. And um, a lot of it, at least from the global environmental change perspective, uses a lot of reuse of data sets. Um, and we're using them in different ways to, inter to look at interconnections and um, forcings and drivers and all sorts of things. So we will use a, an existing data set, but overlay it with, uh, let's say, climate data, with um, demographic data, with health data, with all sorts of different things mm -hmm. to understand more complex, interactive um, issues. And I think so that is a, a key way of, of doing that. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be within um, just global and environmental change. I think when you get to 
um, more interdisciplinary um, questions where you need the data from one domain from an, to another and you start to overlap that, a lot of it is reuse of, of existing data. Yeah, and, I, and uh, in, on the, um, in the planetary side and, and actually the Earth science side as well, um, data from you know, subsequent missions that were collected later that are geodetically controlled with previous data sets just bring a huge amount of value um, because you're able to, uh, you know, go down to certain individual areas and really um, look at it from many different sensors. And it's, it's been, you know, incredibly enabling and, and in fact transformative, I would say, in, in planetary science. Uh, I can give you one short, simple example. When I was director of the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute, we had biologists who had been diving in uh, with the remotely operated vehicle in the Monterey Canyon for years, and they had been noting the occurrence of certain um, benthic organisms where they occurred uh, in the shelf for, for years, and um, that had all been put in a relational database that showed um, the organism, uh, the depth, the location. And it was only years later that people put two and two together and figured out that those animals only occurred where methane was venting on the shelf. And so a geologist came in later and could go back to that relational database and figure out where all the methane vents were along the coast. Can I just quickly add something to that? But I do, I think, understand your point in the sense that we tend to reward um, and expect collection of new data. And so a lot of the projects that we fund, at least from the National Science Foundation, is collection of new data. That usually tends to be a big part of it. So when you're trying to um, encourage this, I think we need to focus on some of the solicitations to mention that kind of approach. I know that the Arctic, um, the Arc Seas uh, program that we had was actually um, dedicated to looking at um, reuse of data. So I think it's um, incumbent on the community, um, but I also think you know the, the funders have a bit of um, push on that as well to, to actually reward ward that and to have the, the reviewers who sit on the panels to look at this as, you know, just as valuable as going out and collecting new data. Okay, thank you for your question. So we've come to the end of our audience questions, and I have just a few minutes to um, make a few uh, concluding comments. First of all, I'd like to thank our excellent panel for the great job they did. I mean, I, I think everyone brought such a variety of perspectives, um, both nationally and internationally, from the standpoint of funders, institute leaders, uh, researchers, people from a variety of disciplines, and I think it really um, gave a, a rich um, overview of um, this uh, thorny topic we uh, had before us. Um, I think it's clear that there wasn't um, a huge um, uh, disagreement among the panel that um, we've already reached a tipping point in terms of uh, views, um, both in uh, terms of um, uh, researchers as well as uh, leaders in the community that um, uh, fair uh, open standards for data um, are um, what need to be not only um, rewarded uh, but also uh, need to be um, uh, enforced. Um, and that um, the view is that this is something that people want to do. People feel that um, it's in their own best interests uh, to do it. And um, as um, Maria said, I think um, so aptly, sharing is all about trust. And everyone wants to feel that scientists are trusted. And when we're transparent about um, where our conclusions came from, then we feel we are earning the trust not only of our fellow scientists, but of anyone who wants to use our work afterwards. Um, uh, there is this sense that um, uh, that that archiving needs that this needs to be open by default, uh, part of the Belmont um, standards. That um, but but it also needs to be open by design, and so we need to build that into everything we're doing. 
And part of that is uh, encouraging this new cadre of um, data um, experts and specialists to help us um, do this. Um, there, um, uh, let's see, um, what else? Um, archiving costs, um, while um, there's a lot of talk about um, these costs being real, and these costs being uh, important, we heard enough examples about them not being covered and not being recognized across the board. And I think this is still a challenge that our community has to face. Um, when um, push comes to shove and we have to trade off a number of, um, you know, there's, there's not an infinite amount of money to, come, to go around, um, trades have to be made. I'm hoping that um, we can work on um, technological solutions to make the sharing and the archiving and everything easier, but we still aren't there yet. So I, I view this as um, an Olympus we, we still have to climb, um, but it will be uh, worth it in the end. Um, I agree uh, completely with Alberto that um, the big data challenge uh, is out there before us, but um, it's not just a challenge, I think it's a promise. I, I think it's a promise that is going to be the future of especially the geosciences, and um, one that, um, as I um, said, I think visualization has to be incorporated in it, and I think that um, part of archiving big data sets should also be archiving their visualization. Um, so I'll leave it at that, and thank you all for um, listening through this session, and hope you all uh, leave with at least a, a new nugget from it. So thank you.